The time has finally come to analyze malware using advanced tactics. <laughs> Finally! We're not messing around anymore, Sergey. Your malware is no match for us because we've got reverse engineering through decompiling, disassembling, and debugging, all of which was covered in this one class in my cybersecurity bachelor's program. So if you're sitting there wondering if you need this to get a job, well, my university thought so. Now, malware analysis is, of course, the process of examining malicious software. Malware. To understand how it works and identify its capabilities, behavior, and potential impact. Now, there are four main steps in analyzing malware. Basic static analysis, basic dynamic analysis, both of which I covered in my last video here. And now we've got advanced static analysis and advanced dynamic analysis. Each step uses different tools and techniques to gather information about malware. And just like before, both methodologies are covered by Try Hack Me. So follow along or you can just watch the chaos unfold. Now, just like any other smart cybersecurity professional, we'll be working inside of a VM to launch the reverse engineering VM of your choice and we'll be using Ghidra. Why? Because it's got a dragon logo, of course. Duh. And because it's free, open source, and has many features that we can use to get proficient in reverse engineering engineering, but mostly because we like dragons. So fire up Ghidra and let's start a new project. You'll want to name the project something hip and trendy like Hello World, or if you're like me, Mad World. Now import whatever malware executable you'd like into your new project. Once imported, you'll get a summary that has really nothing useful on it since we're trying to get to the meat of the malware. Now double click the malware in Ghidra and it will install a C2 communication with Russia. Ah, gotcha. Nah, just kidding. It opens it up for analysis. You'll want to click through and select the defaults unless you know what you're doing and want to customize the options, but we're noobs, so we're just gonna select the defaults. Once it finishes analyzing, you'll get this layout. You've got the program trees where you can view PE headers in their various sections. My last video touched on PE headers, not what we'll be looking at today, but definitely useful to know. The symbol tree has the imports, exports, functions, labels, classes, and namespaces. If you've ever coded a day in your life, you'll know what all of these refer to. The TLDR version of it is, imports are code that executables will call on in order to function. Now this is common in code, referencing existing libraries of code so you don't have to code the same thing over and over again. Exports, this section contains the API function calls being exported by the program. This section is useful when analyzing various DLLs that it calls upon, as it will show all the functions the DLL contains. Functions, this section contains, well, the functions that it finds within the code. Now, clicking on each function will take us to the disassembled code of that function. It also contains the entry function, which you have to search for because it's not in plain sight. If you click the entry function, it will take us to the start of the program that we are analyzing. You also have the decompile section where the pseudo C code is shown. And the middle section is the disassembled code. As you can see, there's a lot of buttons and a lot of intimidating crap everywhere. To get to the assembly code that we're interested in, we'll just double click on the dot text up in the top left. This takes us to the top of the code. There are different approaches to begin analyzing the disassembled code. You could locate the main function from the symbol tree, check the dot text code in the program trees to see the code section and find the entry point as we just did. Or you could search for interesting strings and locate the code to where those strings are referenced. It's also worth noting that different compilers add their own code from various checks while compiling. <laughs> you can expect some garbage assembly code that doesn't make any sense. Now, instead of scrolling through and most likely missing what we're looking for, we can use the search function to find the hello world. As you can see, the arguments being used here to push hello world and call the message box A, which is a box the person will see in their computer's GUI. But now that we've caught a glimpse at the power of disassembly, let's break down C code a little bit and its various constructs and their corresponding assembling code. Once you know a little bit how it's translated, you'll know better what to look for in malware analysis. Now this module provides a hello world executable as it's most likely the very first program that you'll ever encounter if you ever do any coding. It prints hello world on the console when you run it or on the computer GUI. This is a simple C code that will print hello world on the console. And this is an assembly language where hello world is defined as a string in the data section, then uses the right system call to print the string to standard out, which by default is your console. Now let's look at the hello world executable. Scrolling down to the push argument and hello world, we can see the hello world parameter being fed into this function where it's pushed to the stack before calling the print function. Some commonly used code components are for loops, functions, and while loops. Here is a for loop and here is a for loop in assembly. In this code, the main function initializes the loop counter ECX to one and the loop limit EDX to five. The loop label is used to mark the beginning of the loop. Inside the loop, the loop counter is printed to the console using the print 
f function from the standard c library as in the library that standard c has access to after printing the loop counter the loop counter is incremented and the loop limit is checked to see if the loop should continue the loop continues if the counter is still less than or equal to the loop limit if the loop counter exceeds the loop limit and control is passed to the end of the program where the program returns zero AKA the program ends. Confusing? Well, that's for loops for you and programming in general. It's confusing until you get it, then it becomes obvious. Now, if we open the provided for loop executable, find the entry function and check the assembly, we can see how the for loop is translated into disassembly code. You'll notice as you click into each argument, it highlights a corresponding argument on the right decompiler section, which is handy for understanding what each argument does. Now here is a simple add function in C and its corresponding assembly language. The add function starts by having the current base pointer value on the the stack then it sets the base pointer to the current stack pointer value function then moves the value of a and b into the eax register it adds them and then it stores the result in a result variable finally the function moves the value of the result into the eax register restores the previous base pointer value and returns to the calling function and here is a while loop in both c and assembly in this example the move instruction initializes the register ecx20 representing the variable i the loop start label marks the beginning of the loop the cmp instruction compares the value of ECX to 10, if ECX exceeds or equals 10, the loop ends and the program jumps to the loop end label. Otherwise, the value of ECX is pushed onto the stack along with the format string and the value of ECX itself is then printed using printf. Now the add instruction cleans up the stack after the print call. Finally, the value of ECX is incremented and the program jumps back to the loop start label to repeat the loop. Once again, if we take a look at the while loop executable, find our entry function, we can see what arguments are passed. The while loop prints the label, it's fun to learn at THM. Now that's just a taste of what I got taught over three months. Easy, right? Now let's talk Windows APIs. Why are we talking about Windows APIs? Because malware uses them to evade detection. Windows API is a collection of functions and services that Windows operating systems provides to enable developers to create Windows applications while also enabling hackers to create some sneaky malware. Create process A is a function that well, it creates a process. Duh, it takes several parameters, much like other functions, here is an example of C code that uses the create process a function to launch a new process. When compiled into assembly code, the create process a function call looks like this. This assembly code pushes the necessary parameters onto a stack in reverse order and then calls the create process a function. The create process a function then creates a new process and returns a handle to the process and its primary thread. What's a handle? Well, loosely explained, it's an abstract reference to a resource that is used when application software references blocks of memory. Not to be confused with the pointer. That confused the hell out of me in my class. So clearly identifying the API calls in malware and examining the code can help in understanding the purpose of the malware. Malware heavily relies on Windows API, obviously referring to the malware that was designed for Windows operating systems, of course. Uh, duh. So for that reason, it's important to check the import functions in our advanced analysis. Without going over every single one, here's a list of the commonly used Windows APIs. Keyloggers, downloaders, C2 communication, data exfiltration, droppers, API hooking, anti d debugging and VM detection. This last one is particularly important because it well hardens the malware and it makes our jobs as white hats, mad hats, more difficult and quite maddening. All right, so we're all experts in code constructs and assembly now. Let's analyze something I am painfully aware of now after my company's last penetration test. Process hallowing, which utilizes the process injection technique. Here's a summary of how it works. A new process is created using the create process A API, this process will act as a legitimate process and will be hollowed out. NT suspend process is then used to suspend the new process. Then memory is allocated in the suspended process using the virtual alloc EX API. This memory will then be used to hold the malicious code. The malicious code is written to the allocated memory using the write process memory API. Then the entry point of the process is modified to point to the address of the malicious code using the set thread context and get thread context API. APIs. Then the suspended process is resumed using the NT resume process API. This will cause the process to execute the malicious code. Finally, it cleans up the process and any resources during the process. Let's look at an example of process hollowing 
in an executable. Load up your clearly benign malware into Ghidra and let's analyze it. Since we know what we're looking for is process injection, we're going to look for create process a function. Obviously, if we didn't know what type of malware this was, then we wouldn't start here. But we're amazing and can spot process injections from a mile away because we definitely didn't miss it during a company penetration test and closed the alert as benign only to get a phone call from our boss to double check the alert. That didn't, that didn't happen. <laughs> let's head to imports. Again, this is where APIs are imported for use by the executable. And let's find the create process a API. Now, if you right click it and click show references to, which will then display all the program sections where its function is called. As you can see, right before the function is called, the value zero X four is pushed onto the stack, which represents the suspended state. If you wanna know more about process creation flags, you can reference Microsoft's webpage here. Now, if we go into the display function graph, we can get a graph view of the disassembled code to visually show us what is happening during this part of the code. If it fails to create a victim process in the suspended state, it will move to the block on the right. If it successfully creates the victim process, it will move to block two, but it has evaded our AVG antivirus. Color me surprised. So it moves on to the create file A API, which which is used to either create or open an existing file. Let's search for this API in the symbol tree section and go to the code where it's referencing. Now the malware hollows the process. Malware uses ZW unmap view of section or NT unmap view of section API calls to unmap the target process memory. Let's search for both and see if the API is called. NT unmap view of section takes exactly two arguments. The base address, which is the virtual address, to be unmapped, and then the handle to the process that needs to be hollowed. Once the process is hollowed, malware must allocate the memory using virtual alloc ex before writing the process. Let's find the instances of virtual alloc ex API calls in the same way. Arguments passed to the function include a handle to the process, address to be allocated, size, allocation type, and the memory protection flag. Once the memory is allocated, the malware will attempt to write the suspicious process or code into the memory of the hollowed process. The write process memory API is used for this purpose. Now let's locate the function and analyze the code. Once all is sorted out, the malware will get hold of the thread using the set thread context and then resume the thread using the resume thread API to execute the code. <laughs> now, wasn't that fun? You know what's more fun? Advanced dynamic malware analysis, where we can get around all the various evasion techniques used by the bad guys to thwart our advanced static analysis. So we're going to execute the malware and hope we don't infect our entire network. Subscribe for part two. Oh.